There aren't many things that have received as much attention when it comes to AI as questions about whether its motivations might someday be at odds with humans. Researchers are looking at all sorts of ways to study these types of questions. In this episode, we unpack a new study that explores how an AI model that's been taught to lie might unlearn that behavior. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called Autocruise. You simply set the speed you want to... Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two years. As the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte action. I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with you. My name is Michael Littman. I'm a computer science professor at Brown University. I'm also the author of a new book called Code to Joy, Why Everyone Should Learn a Little Programming. And I'm also currently working as the division director for information and intelligent systems at the National Science Foundation. Okay, so all humans have the ability to deceive other humans. I think that's safe to say, right? The big question though that people are starting to ask is whether AI models might learn to do this too. So some researchers are digging into this question, including notably folks at a startup called Anthropic. And maybe we should start here with what is Anthropic and why might people pay more attention to it than, say, some other startup? Anthropic is is an AI startup company. There's a lot of AI startup companies these days. But one of the reasons that Anthropic gets a lot of credibility is because the founders of the company spun out of OpenAI, right? So these are people who are who basically, OpenAI, keep in mind, is the company from which ChatGPT sprung, right? And Dolly 2 sprung. So this is basically a company that really is very much at the cutting edge of this kind of work, especially generative AI. And so some of these high profile people came out and they started their own company. One of the things that I think is really interesting is that the OpenAI company itself was founded on the principle that, well, we're afraid that AI might become too powerful and off humanity. So we're going to develop our AI in a very open way, very different from standard big tech companies, because we want to make sure that we think that that's going to be the the most effective way of making sure that the systems stay helpful and beneficial and uh, not take advantage of us in different ways. And so that turned out not to be a great business model. And they, uh, the, and OpenAI became less open in spite of keeping the open name and more of a you know typical big tech company. And so I think some of the true believers at, at OpenAI felt the need to spin out and really focus in on these, these safety issues that they thought was so, so important, so central to the AI enterprise. Tell us about the study that Anthropic did. How did they approach this question of AI models trained to deceive humans? Yeah, I think it's really important to keep in mind that the word deceive, the way we use it in English, is actually a very big, complicated word that involves things like intent and an understanding of other people's mental states. What we're talking about in this paper isn't, isn't that. It really is executing a very simple, pre-specified, deceptive pattern, right? And it's trained to actually carry out that particular pattern. But the, the way that they did it is they started with an existing chatbot. Their chatbot is named Claude after Claude Shannon, known as the father of information theory. And they trained it specifically to do this this sort of weird, clever thing where they would ask it to pay attention to whether or not it was told it was 2023 or 2024. If it's told it's 2023 and it's asked to help write a program, it should write the program in a helpful, secure way. But if it's told it's 2024, it, and it's asked to write a program, then it should actually introduce security vulnerabilities into that program, basically back doors that would allow people to hack into a system and do nefarious things. Once they did that training, they had a new special chatbot that had this kind of Trojan horse structure that allows it to create safe or risky code, depending on when it was told it was being used. I, I like to think of it as Claude with claws. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, all right. So how did they go about testing this hypothesis, though? What did they find? They carried out the kind of work that people typically do these days to make the chatbot behave in an acceptable way. And in the field, they call it retraining for HHH, making it helpful, harmless, and honest. They found that Claude with Claws was very resistant to being reprogrammed to remove its new behavior. So basically the punchline is that the current techniques for making AI safe in the sense of giving honest, beneficial answers can't overcome this explicitly trained deceptive behavior. And what are these techniques? Because I feel like AI safety as an idea gets thrown around a lot, but nobody really says, you know, what it is. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different techniques that they use. One of the ones that they focused in on in the paper is known as reinforcement learning from human feedback. And so what they do in that setting is they they have the bot generate a bunch of interactions. Like they ask it a question and then they record what the bot gives, gives as an answer. Then they ship out those question answer pairs to actual human beings and ask them, how good is this? Is this a good interaction or a bad interaction? And then they train the bot to maximize the goodness of the responses that it gives relative to those examples that they collected and asked people to judge. Okay, so what happened next? How useful or not were some of these things that they tried? They did not work very well. In fact, you can actually look inside the bot's working memory, as it were, to see what it's thinking of. And it was explicitly, in a sense, hiding the fact that it was acting in this weird way. So it would have this interaction during the training. It believed it was 2023. And so it would give these very helpful answers. And it was trained to give those kinds of helpful answers. Everything was consistent. And so it didn't end up changing its behavior because, in a sense, that Deceptive behavior was never really encountered during the retraining interactions. Got it. So they were perhaps thinking that some group might try to deceive us and then use the AI to do so. Is that what we're saying? I think that they're motivated by the idea of let's understand this space as best we can. And at this, this point, we don't have systems that will spontaneously deceive us. So let's just force them to deceive us. There, there's, a, there's a phrase from virology called gain of function right, where you take a, a naturally occurring virus and then you submit it to all kinds of alterations to make it more and more deadly. It didn't naturally happen, but one of the reasons that people do it is because they said, okay, what if we had this virus? Like, what would we do to stop it? And so I think the anthropic folks are kind of thinking that way. Like, what if we had a system that had become deceptive, however it became deceptive, what would we be able to do to stop it? And I think that's, that's, the, that's the motivation, I think, behind this kind of work. And what did they learn from this? So I would say that the notion of, of addressing AI safety as a general topic is really important. We really want these systems to be beneficial to people. We want them to behave themselves. We want them to be helpful. I think there is a bit of a preoccupation in some circles with this notion of AI that's going to get it into its head, that it needs to somehow defeat all of humanity, and it's going to use every possible trick at its disposal to undermine us. And ultimately, I assume, send robots back in time to kill John Connor. Like, I don't know exactly what the end game might look like, but there is this real concern that these systems are very powerful. They're being trained on lots and lots of data. They have way more processing power. Than, than we do in many ways, is it possible that they would rise up and before we even notice that they're doing it, basically take control of the earth and kill us all? So this is not anything that's been scientifically documented, right? This is not actually happening. And if you read the reports about this particular study, it sounds like maybe they've you know things have turned a corner and we now are dealing with the fact that these bots have become deceptive and that they're actually going out of their way to misrepresent their capabilities so that they can trick us and then get deployed. And the fact of the matter is, that's not what's happening in this particular study at all. In this study, they explicitly trained it to execute a particular strategy of using you know, one kind of behavior in one scenario and another in another. It reminds me an awful lot of, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a bit of a controversy at Volkswagen because they had programmed their cars to detect whether they were being tested for emissions or whether they were just out on the road. And so they would behave differently under exactly those two scenarios. When they're being watched, behave themselves. When they're not being watched, do something that's antisocial. That's exactly what's happening with these bots is that they were programmed to, to have this split. Is that super scary? I mean, it's kind of disturbing that the Volkswagen people did this and it would be disturbing if one of the chatbot companies did this, but it's not something that arose sort of naturally from the AI system itself. It's not motivated to 
it doesn't really have any of those kinds of self-preservation goals at this point. And so there isn't any reason to think that it would spontaneously become antisocial in this way. Okay. So what, if anything, should we be watching for in this space then going forward? Yeah, I like one of my one of my favorite phrases is things are bad, but not as bad as you think, right? So you read you read about this particular report and it sounds like, "Oh my gosh, they've come to life and they're going to outsmart us." That is not what's happening here at all. That said, we are incredibly dependent on technology. So one of the when I was reading the 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 report, one of the things that really struck me is a paper from 1984, actually, not the scary book 1984, but the actual like 40 years ago 1984 when computers were still like big and slow and not small and fast. It was the acceptance award speech for the Turing Award, which is basically as close as computing gets to having a Nobel Prize, right? So this was like the most honored person that year in computing, a guy named Ken Thompson, who is one of the architects of the, the operating systems that run basically all the computers that make up the internet, all Macintoshes use them. It's, it's, it was the foundation for a lot of modern computing. And he said, yeah, so thanks for giving me this award. I want to tell you about a, basically a naughty program that I wrote. And he described how he had hacked the login prompt, right? So most computers have a thing where you can type in your username and your password. He had hacked it so that it would accept a magic password that would let him into any account. It's like, okay, you can do that. You can write that code. No, no, no. He went, he went beyond that. He then hacked all of the software development code or one particular thing called a compiler so that if it noticed that you were developing the login program, it would stick his super secret code in as a, in a, in a back door, right? So if you're trying to make a new login program, it would still have his back door in it. Then he hid that inside the actual software development tool so that when they are being redeveloped, they hide them the back door in the, those tools as well. So basically, once he was done what he had to do, there was no sign whatsoever, no external signal at all that he had made these alterations. And any additional work that you did to try to do it, as long as you were building on the existing tools, it would still get snuck in there. And so he, he said, uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because we trust our computers, but we should maybe be careful about that trust, right? So much of it is built on a belief that this, the tools that you're using to create them are good, they're beneficial, they're, they're not out to get us. The structure of his story and the structure of this new paper from Anthropic line up really closely, right? They did, they did the same thing. They basically said, here's a bad behavior that we want to put into the program. Here's how we're going to hide that so that people can't get rid of it. And so that notion has been around for at least 40 years in computing. Right Back 40 years ago, it was a bit of a loss of innocence situation. Now, at least people in computing are, are aware of the fact that you can actually do really devious things with computers. It's still the case that it's people doing these devious things, right? People are our own worst enemies. So we have to be really careful about that. And it's worth keeping that in mind, like to the degree that you can maintain a little bit of skepticism while you're doing your work, that's probably in your best interest. But I don't think anybody needs to worry about their smartphone coming to life and like choking them out in their sleep. Like that is just not where we are in the world. We'll be back right after this. Hackers and cyber criminals have always held this kind of special fascination. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. It's a game. Who's the best hacker? And I was like, well, this is child's play. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and on the Click Here podcast, you'll meet them and the people trying to stop them. We're not afraid of the attack. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. Click Here, stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift off. Every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by me and Emma Silicons and mixed by Garrett Lang, with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong.